Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast, infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stéphanie Roussel. Bonjour, I have a question for you. If you're like me, you spend a lot of time waiting. So does it feel like wasted time? In a way, we're always waiting for something or someone. I guess it's part and parcel of living in a universe that's framed by time and space. Waiting for an event, that feels very time-bound. A wedding, a birthday, a vacation. Even if it's something small like the mail to arrive, the dinner to take place, or a virus to heal um, and to leave so that we can heal. Sometimes there's a date attached to that waiting, like maybe a wedding or a birthday or a vacation, but sometimes there isn't. You don't exactly know when the mail is going to come, when the virus you've been fighting is finally going to allow you to resume life. That's for events, but what about people? What We're waiting for a person. I know the feeling of waiting for my kids to come home from college or my husband to come home from a business trip. There's also when we wait for a loved one to come home from the hospital, when we wait for a friend to come for a visit. And that feels time-bound, but more often than not, when it's about relationships, there's a, an element of being space-bound too, because in the examples I suggested, the person is physically not here yet. And again, sometimes there's a date attached to that waiting and sometimes there isn't. One of my greatest joys is when my kids come home from college and I know exactly the day, but sometimes we don't exactly have a date attached. So how do we approach and then how do we experience waiting? And, and since it takes up such a big portion of our time, how do we learn to live in the waiting from the perspective of God? We spend so much time waiting. So does it feel like wasted time? Does our life only matter when we're not waiting, when we're achieving much, when we're creating much, when we're feeling useful? And biblically speaking, the answer is a resounding no, because God is too intricately involved in the details of our lives, which means at least this. It means that he's also involved in our seasons of waiting. Waiting, oh, maybe it's just me, but I suspect it's not. Waiting often feels like something that's been forced upon us, right? At least I've discovered it to be so in the American culture. Westerners, we're averse to waiting. We live in the culture, the American culture here in the 21st century that has invented and then perfected and that now extols instant gratification. It feels these days that I can receive my Amazon Prime order even almost before I've even ordered it, or at least the same day, right? And if I don't, then I feel like I'm being cheated almost. We we deserve to receive our Amazon Prime orders even almost before we've ordered them. There's something almost ironic about that. Our entire life seems built around shortcuts to minimize waiting. And that's why we're so allergic to waiting, because we're so completely out of practice. And yet, waiting is our lot. So what if we entered waiting differently? And so I ask again, we spend so much time waiting. Does it feel like wasted time? And more importantly, is it actually wasted time, regardless of how we feel about it or not? And again, because God is very intricately involved in the details of our lives, the answer to that is no. He's involved in our waiting. We've all heard this, but the very fact that we're so allergic to waiting mm, might indicate that we're not quite living like we believe it. Or again, maybe it's just me. If you've never struggled with waiting, even recently, then this episode today is not for you. But if you're in a season of waiting for something or waiting for someone, or if you'd like to make sense of a past season of waiting, or maybe equip yourself for a potential future season of waiting, then let's hang out together today. And let me invite a couple of French words to keep us company. There's a French word for waiting. Well, one of them. I'm going to introduce you to several of them. To wait or to expect in French, I would say the closest translation is attendre. And if you speak any French, you might be familiar with that. Attendre. But then there's to patient. Patienter. Patienter, to patient, is actually a verb. 
It's a concept. And that's what I want us to wrap our American minds around today. To patient as an action verb. Not something that is just a noun, patience, patience, or to be a patient, but to make it an action verb. How can waiting, patienting, be an action verb? It's not a noun, it's not an adjective, though it's those two, right? I'm, I'm not going to define the first one I mentioned, attendre, it's wait, it's, it's too broad of a term, just like to wait. But to, to patient, patienter, is a very specific word, and its uses in scripture are compelling and, dare I say, Hmm, challenging, at least for yours truly. So let's focus on that. Patient, to patient as a verb. The, the first way we could look at it is to say it's to behave like a patient. What does a patient do? He or she awaits treatments and trusts doctors. So to ponder what it means to be a patient as a noun is the beginning of understanding what it means to patient as a verb. So what is a patient? It's someone who waits at the doctor's office for an appointment because there's a health problem and you're going to go to an expert to help you find a cure. So what does a patient do? A patient is actively waiting. In a waiting room, patients wait until they are received and seen to be cured. The patient came here and is now waiting. And, and can I say, there's a few contexts where I feel more helpless than in the doctor's waiting room. It feels like such a, a waste of time, right? And yet, let me take you to scripture in, in the first of four examples in French that use the action verb that doesn't ex exist in English, the verb to patient. P the scripture is Ezekiel 44, 26. Now, the context is about how the priests of the Old Testament were to behave. And specifically, if someone of their family died, how they were to resume their priestly duties after they were ritually unclean from having been in contact with a corpse of their family member. Remember, there's no funeral homes. So if someone dies, you kind of have to deal with it yourself. Now, I'm going to read several translations. And, and as you've heard me say through the course of the series, I've really spent a lot of time in a bunch of Bible translations in English and in French and, and in, in Hebrew and Greek too, uh, through some of my online tools. So in English, it's the idea of waiting, of numbering, of counting, of reckoning. And in French, it's patienter, to patient. Now, I looked at the Hebrew too, and the Hebrew used here is alit safar, And it means to be, a, to, to be a scribe. So not a patient, but a scribe. To tell something, to declare something, to number something. That's the most common occurrences of the word. So to scribe, so which means to record, to number, to tell. So it's, these are acts of active patienting. There's something methodical, almost scientific about it. It's a bit like what a patient expects in a doctor's waiting room. See what I did there? I just used all three words in one sentence. It's what a patient expects in a doctor's waiting room. Patient, expect, wait. A patient in a waiting room is waiting intentionally. That's why it's not completely a waste of time. There's a purpose to the visit and the waiting room is, is this antechamber to this purpose being realized. And, and then once you're done with the doctor, maybe you go back to the waiting room while they run some tests. You're waiting, but something is happening in the background and progress is being made even if you don't see it. Now, I really still don't enjoy waiting rooms, because I've grown allergic to waiting in my instant gratification culture. But there is so much more to patienting than just waiting in a waiting room. The patient is forced to wait. I'm pretty sure I've never willingly chosen to wait in a waiting room. It's always a good surprise when there's no wait. And, and this is where our patient cannot help us any longer, because patienting is not about shouldering the burden of a forced wait. So let's look at patienting as the act of behaving with patience as a virtue. Unlike waiting, which, which can seem forced upon me, it's not something I choose myself, at least not naturally. To choose to behave with patience is not the same thing as being forced to wait. It's not just a matter of choice, but it's a matter of perspective. If I only accept seasons or moments of waiting when I have chosen them, mm, is that really patience? Is that really practicing waiting in a way that honors God? And more to the point, if God is truly in charge, truly sovereign, and truly involved in the intricate details of my life, as, as scripture clearly says, then he's the one who invited me into this season of waiting in the first place. So is it really forced and imposed on me? Could it be that it is God's choice for me? 
You see, forced waiting can be seen as a choice that God has made for me, for me, on my behalf, for my good, for my benefit. If God is truly for me, then what seems to me like a season of prolonged forced waiting is actually for me. And therefore, I can choose to lean in, to learn to see it through the perspective of God. And so it goes from forced, forced waiting to for patience. This is for me. It's an invitation to behave with patience. It's an attitude and it's a mindset. Now that's going to require self-awareness as opposed to this imposed external force. In other words, it has to do with being more than it has to do with doing, which the other word, wait, attendre, really has more of that notion of doing something. But to, to patient as a verb, it has to do with being a patient, being patient. So it, there's that element of being. Now, let me take you to another scripture, Job 36.2. This is where Elihu, Elihu, I'm not sure how you say his name, he's talking with Job and the three friends, right? So remember the three friends give Job terrible advice and then Elihu, Elihu shows up. And in Job 35, the chapter prior to this one, he rebukes Job. And then, and now in chapter 36, he's mostly reminding Job of who God is. That's what Elihu does in Job 36. And in verse 2, this is what Elihu tells Job. Stay with me a little longer. That's the message. Wait for me a little, NASB. Bear with me a little, ESV. Suffer me a little in the King James. So bear with me, suffer me a little, wait a little longer, stay with me a little longer. Initially, it feels like Job was forced into his circumstances and his condition. And, and he was. He didn't choose the misery that was inflicted upon him at all. Now, in Hebrew, alit kathar means to wait, to surround the, the idea of being entirely surrounded, again, forced circumstances. Uh, Psalm 20 to 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. That's the word. Psalm 142, 7, the righteous will surround me. You look after me, God. Judges 20, 43, they surrounded Benjamin and they pursued them. Uh, Habakkuk 1, 4, the wicked surround the righteous. So this idea to wait in the sense of being surrounded, it also means to be set, to suffer, to await. It's this notion of expectancy, but it could also be positive. For example, Proverbs 14, 18, the sensible are crowned with knowledge. They're surrounded with knowledge. It's that, it's that Hebrew word that in English is to, to suffer, to wait, to stay. They are suffering. They are being crowned. They are bearing the weight of knowledge. So the idea of being surrounded, it's this slow activity of active patienting. And that's what Elihu, Elihu is providing for Job here. He's surrounding Job with God. In Job 35, there's a rebuke of Job. And then in 36, there's a praise for God. In other words, Elihu here is surrounding Job with truth. He's encircling him so that Job has no escape from the truth, from the presence of God. And, and that's indeed what happens towards the end of the book of Job, if you're, if you're familiar with it. Now, Elihu does it very imperfectly. But as you know, God then proceeds to surround Job quite perfectly in chapters 38 to 41. And that totally changes Job's perspective on his circumstances. And I would dare say on his perspective on waiting within the circumstances of suffering. So he's learning patienting amidst his drastic, extreme circumstances. And he's moving away from sheer waiting, attendre, and he's moving into the being of patienting. To patient is a painful thing that can be forced upon us when we're surrounded. And the reason why Job was surrounded is because he had dedicated himself to learning from the Lord. Remember, that was the starting point. He was doing well. God was teaching him. And that is exactly why he's invited into this place of patienting and being surrounded by the Lord himself. And I wonder if you need to hear this today. Are you being surrounded by the Lord yourself? Are you being invited into the patienting, 
the practice of patienting that is so painful, but that bears such incredible fruit in intimacy with the Lord, as Job would probably um, testify. But that's not the whole picture, because under the tutelage of God himself, who is our perfect teacher, Job is learning the third point I'm making here today, is that to patient is an action verb. It's a being, but it's also a doing. It's the external manifestation of an internal quieted spirit. Also, it's, it's bigger to patient as a verb. It's bigger than just being patient, because it connotes the an activity. We, in French, I mean, in French, we have be patient, which is slightly different, like your be patient. It's an exhortation. It's coming from the outside. To patient is more than just being told to be patient. Because to patient as an active verb comes from within. It's like an inner spring that flows outward. To patient is being active. And so there's at least Three areas I'd like to suggest as practical manifestations of patienting. First, prayer. And, and one of the aspects of prayer is intercession. It's this boldly assessing of my need or the need of another before the Lord. And then it's this patienting in the sense of surrendering to God, even as I bring my petition to him. Intercession is a powerful experience, manifestation, practice of patienting as an active verb. But prayer is, is not just intercession, it's also praise. And that is so hard to do in the waiting. A sacrifice of praise, a willful conscious choice and decision to side with God and not with our pain or anxiety or waiting, that's a radical choice of faith, of active patienting. So that's prayer, just very briefly. And then there's hope. Hope is another area where we are actively invited into the holy act and the holy being of patienting. Hope is when we wait for something or someone, to go back to what I was saying at the beginning of our episode together today, but being patiently waiting, now that's an invitation to hope. It, it's not just waiting, it's patienting. Romans 5 verses 3 and 4, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Do you hear how there's the patienting that is taking place in that suffering that produces perseverance, that produces character, that produces hope? Hope. James 1.3, the testing of your faith produces endurance. 2 Peter 1 verses 5 and 6, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. Now, perseverance and hope are kind of interchangeable here. In other words, Paul in Romans, James in the book of James, and Peter in 2 Peter here, they're all three saying the exact same thing. It's a pretty common theme in the New and the Old Testament to hope as a result of active patienting. It's a practice we develop. It's not something that we are naturally born with. We have to cultivate the holy patienting that is so countercultural. And the third element beyond prayer and hope where I think we can develop, cultivate, nurture, patienting is serving, looking for ways to bless others and to honor God even as we patient. If patienting is an activity, then how do I actually live it? How can I seek opportunities to lift my gaze outward so that I see the needs that others have? While I patient for my own resolution of my problem, how can I be part of someone else's resolution? How can I be God's hands and feet towards the end of the wait for someone else? Now, as I enter that, 
it's more likely, most, most likely really to generate more prayer and hope. Because if they're, the resolution to their own problem is close, then it gives me hope for my own resolution of my own problem and my own active patienting at the same time. Do you see that? There's a virtual cycle that takes place when I serve others in the midst of my own patienting. And that is hard to do. Just as it is hard to pray, interceding for others, and as it is hard to hope when we are patienting. Now, scripture, uh, let me take you to James 5, 7. It's a perfect example of active waiting. In the NASB, it says, Therefore, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and the late rains. So in English, be patient, therefore be patient, and the farmer waits patiently. So be patient and wait patiently. Now, because it's the New Testament, it's in Greek, not in Hebrew, it's makrothemeo, which is to be patient, to have patience, to have long patience, to, to bear long, to suffer long, to be long-suffering. It's nine times in the New Testament in Luke 18, 7, will he delay long? In Hebrews 7, 15, Abraham patiently waited. In French, that particular verse of Abraham waiting patiently is he exercised patience. He practiced patience. So it's not like he sits there and just waits. He practices it. It's active work. He proved and tested his patience through this épreuve. Remember when we studied that word épreuve? Well, épreuve, an épreuve, a hardship, a test, is a use of patience. He proves his patience by exercising his patience through the trial of that épreuve that he's going through. Do you see how it's all connected? And in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is patient towards you. Now, all of these um, round up in James 5, 7, because to patient like the farmer, that's a test of character. It's not just the growth of virtue, but it's also a learning curve. How do you know that you're growing in patience unless you have opportunities to test it? And how will you grow unless you're practicing it? You are the farmer, and I am the farmer too. And our crop is patience. And we can only grow patience by practicing patience. Patience isn't something you wake up to one morning. Uh, I mean, this prayer, Lord, make me a patient person quickly. I mean, <laughs> as tempting as it is, it's an oxymoron. It's impossible. Grow patience like a farmer. That means slowly, by practicing it. A farmer sows some of the seed he could have consumed or sold but instead, he sows them so that he gets a new crop. And in the same way, we sow the little patience we have. And by practicing patience, we reap more patience. We take no shortcuts. So we see in James 5, 7 that to patient like the farmer, that's a test of character. Now it's a test. And everything we've talked about, about épreuve that we've studied in previous episodes and that you need to check out if you haven't, now that all applies here. Bring it all in here. I could repeat everything I just said in those episodes there. Now, remember what we also said. We said that a good teacher won't test you to fail you. We saw this with épreuve, which is a test and a trial of both. That's episode 318 and 320. So in the school of patienting, God is testing us to prove us. Even more, in the school of patienting, God is testing us to approve us to prove us and to approve us. So how do we know we have grown a new crop of patience in our lives through much practice? Here's another French word for you. Now that word, you're familiar with it. It's the word savoir-faire. What does it look like when you have learned to patient well? Savoir is to know something as a skill, a craft, an expertise. And it's part, by the way, it's such a special word that I've taken four or five of my favorite words and I've turned them into a meal for you. And um, it's our French faith course that's available for purchase separately. It, there's two French words to the English word to know. And one of them is savoir, which is Again, means to know something as a skill, a craft, or an expertise. And it's all detailed in that course. Now, savoir. Now, there's faire, savoir-faire. Faire is to do something. It can also mean to make something. So, savoir-faire is literally 
to know how to do something. Know how. It just sounds fancier in French, but savoir faire is the same thing as know how. Now, the French definition um, of savoir faire is that it's a competence that is acquired through experience in practical matters in a professional setting. That's my translation of the French dictionary, La Rousse. It's a hard earned expertise. It's an expert craftsman, it's a, a culinary chef, it's a skilled artist, it's a brilliant businessman, it's a tactful winemaker, an exquisite baker, it's a seasoned gardener. They have all mastered savoir-faire in their area of expertise. There's a fam famous French saying that says, um, to earn money, it's better to have savoir-faire than simply savoir In other words, uh, in order to make a living, you need savoir-faire, not just knowledge. And because indeed, it has to do with applying our knowledge in practical ways. Now, in English, according to Merriam-Webster, savoir-faire is capacity for appropriate action and especially a polished sureness in social behavior. That definition surprised me. There's a social dimension to savoir-faire in English that is simply not there in French. In French, savoir-faire is, is really purely technical, practical, And I looked deeper and I discovered that this definition from Webster is actually closer to the French. Savoir-faire is likely to stress, to emphasize worldly experience and this sure awareness of what is proper or expedient. Now, there's another French saying for you. Um, for the youth, it's better to have savoir-faire than to inherit wealth. Think of it. Now, that is countercultural. It is better to have savoir-faire than to inherit wealth when you are young. In other words, you're better off in life when you have know-how even more than if you have inherited wealth. Because if you don't know how to manage your wealth, you're going to lose it. It takes savoir-faire to earn and then to keep wealth. So because youth has the, have their entire life before them, they have time to practice that savoir-faire before they get that wealth. And I guess it applies to more than wealth, obviously, and it applies to more than youth. So when it comes to patienting well, what does it look like when we have learned to patient well? How do we master the savoir-faire of patienting? That reminds me of Job, the lessons he learned of God in chapters 48, 38 to 41. He might have had knowledge about God before, but now as Job perceives his own tiny perspective and the greatness of God, Job acquires the hard-earned expertise of savoir-faire in matters of faith. But allow me to take you to someone other than Job. Numbers 12.3 in the NASB. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any person who, has, who was on the face of the earth. Now, that always cracks me up because you know who wrote this, right? Moses did. So Moses calls himself the most humble man on earth. Is that really the most humble thing he could say? It, it's just... It always cracks me up. He said so himself. In English, it says that he's humble and meek. In French, interestingly, two out of the four French translations that I used use the word patient. The other two have the word humble. In French, it says, and you're going to pick up on it, Moïse était un homme très patient, plus que tout autre homme sur la terre. So, is it patient or is it humble? You know? It's actually the same thing. In Hebrew, it means humble, lowly, meek. It's from a word that means exercised into humility. Exercised into humility. Someone who has practiced humility to the point of savoir-faire. That's my paraphrase. So it's this active humility that has been drilled into you through practice and by an inner welcoming of it. Mm. I want to suggest that Moses had learned the savoir-faire of patienting. Think of it. He spent 40 years as a royal prince, 40 years in the desert as a nobody shepherd, and then 40 years leading his people and weaving an absolutely unique legacy. Where do you think Moses learned the savoir-faire of patienting well? Not in the palace. Maybe your youth proverb applies here, better savoir-faire than inherited wealth. I mean, he had to unlearn what he thought he knew as a prince. He had inherited wealth, but not savoir-faire. He had had that inherited wealth from his youth, but now he needed the savoir-faire in the school of patienting. 
So what does God do? God sends him in the desert. Moses learned to patient in the desert. The desert of his middle years, they cured him of pride. The desert of the wilderness and the Israelites among the throng of the people, that's where Moses' patienting was refined and tested and, and visible for all to see. And, and even us, can you imagine having your life recorded the way Moses was? That's no joke. Now, I want to take you to other translations of patient in French. There's this idea of persevering, of enduring, the notion of slow, slow work. It doesn't just happen. And then there's the idea of when God is patient, when God is slow to anger. Now, <laughs> you may know this, but interestingly, to patient used to be a verb in English but it fell out of use because efficiency kicked in. To patient actually was a verb in English. It just still is in French, but it's been lost in English. In 1594, Shakespeare in Titus Andronicus says, patient yourself, madam, and pardon me. Patient yourself, madam, and pardon me. So to patient was a verb. And then in 1647, there's a biblical commentary on 2 Thessalonians. And um, here's what the commentary says. Faith patienteth the heart. Faith patienteth the heart. Now, that's a tongue twister for this native French speaker. Trust me, I said it really, really slowly. But basically, faith patience the heart. Hmm. So it used to be a verb, but it isn't anymore in English. So maybe the problem is that we don't value patienting as an action in our modern Anglo-Saxon efficient life. The French, yeah, we're more Latin, we're slower, and that comes with pros and cons. But we learn to patient in many ways. We eat our meals very slowly. We patient between courses. There's no buffet. There's no everything on the table at once. We have paced meals. And again... This cultivates waiting like a farmer waits for his seed to become the food that adorns our tables. So we eat our meals slowly. Another area where we are trained into waiting and patienting, and you may relate to that more, is bureaucratic red tape. I mean, if you think it's bad in Anglo-Saxon settings, oh man, try Latin settings. It teaches you humility and patience for sure. I've lived in two Latin cultures and two Anglo-Saxon cultures, and there's a massive difference in how red tape is handled. And it's a lot faster and more efficient in Anglo-Saxon settings, believe me. And the third area I could think of was customer service. You know, there's waiting table, there's uh, eating our meals, there's bureaucratic red tape, but customer service, oh man, customer service in Latin cultures is not like it is in Anglo-Saxon cultures. The client is not always right. Usually the restaurant waiter is. But by the way, the waiter who waits on you in French, he's called a serveur. A server, someone who is supposed to serve you. Does that sound more humble? Maybe, but only if he's patient enough to wait. Otherwise, he will serve you on his own time and in his own way, or her own time and her own way. A good server is maybe better than a good waiter, but uh, <clears throat> I would take a good waiter over a bad server any day. Now, a bad service, which is unfortunately still common in France, even though less and less, that's going to teach you as on the receiving end of it, patience, long-suffering, and humility, which is why we're not so keen on bad service here in Anglo-Saxon settings. Bad service is disappearing in France because, and let me be cynical here for a second, because I think that tips and service huh, are less and less included in the meal. It used to be. It used to be that 18% was always included in your final bill. So we never had to tip waiters, which might explain bad service, now that service is less and less included, we need to tip, which means that quality of service is improving because we pay for it. Now that says a lot about the human heart. If you were paid to wait well, would it change how you experience your waiting? Hmm. Question for you. What if you actually are paid for your waiting? What if you were paid with patience? 
What if the reward of your waiting was manifold and included patience, joy, kindness, a deeper sense of the presence of God? If you were paid, quote unquote, like this, for your waiting, would it change your perspective enough that you would become better at waiting? Hmm. I'm going to wrap it up in the next few moments here. Now, what I want you to ponder is this idea of a sense of holy expectancy. What if to patient was to wait with a deadline? And that's the fourth example of scripture I have for you. Revelation 6, 11. It's speaking of the people in heaven who have died during the tribulation at the end of time. Here's the verse. A white robe was given to each of them and they were told that they were to rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed even as they had been was completed also. Now, I tried to make it obvious what the word here is. Um, rest for a little while longer to sit patiently, to sit back and wait, to wait patiently, to rest a little longer, to rest and wait patiently. These are all different translations of that same verse in different English translations. There's no more action here, just waiting, but it's waiting with a holy deadline. Like James, be patient until the coming of the Lord. And also like Job, wait a little longer. And Ezekiel too, seven days. So all the references we've talked about, even if it's not a clear reference, there is a deadline. There is a holy deadline. Now, the Greek used here, anapao, for rest a little while longer, it means to cause or to permit someone to cease from movement or labor in order to recover, in order to collect your strength, to give rest, to refresh, to keep quiet, to be calm, to have patient expectation. It's a rather quite common word. And it's used in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, says Jesus, and I will give you rest. Literally, I will rest you unto your rest. It's there twice. So how do we learn to rest? By Jesus resting us. So when you feel forced into waiting, when you feel arrested into waiting, it's really Jesus arresting you into rest. When we are arrested, quote unquote, we are literally stopped in our tracks. We're prevented from continuing. Jesus is arresting us into rest. I mean, talk about embracing the value of waiting. The holy deadline that Jesus sets here is simple. Rest until you are rested. Wait until you have patience. Patient until you are patient. Now, 1 Corinthians 16, 18 and 2 Corinthians 16, 13 use the same idea of being refreshed. You drink water until you're refreshed. You sit in the shade when you're too hot until you've cooled off. You wait until you have become patient. Wow. Now, a couple of additional thoughts as I'm wrapping things up. I've really been looking for that perfect word in English for the French, patiente. Can we find something better maybe than to patient? It's not to expect, which is to wait with a deadline in a way too. But there is something more certain about expecting. It includes more readily the notion of a deadline. Whereas this holy waiting... There's something that builds up the muscle of faith in ways that expecting just doesn't. So, I don't know, to await? Is it the same way as to patient? Maybe that's a good way to say it. Maybe we don't wait on God. Maybe we await Him. I like this. There's a, there's a sense of holy expectancy that is built in. I would love your thoughts. What is a good English word for the French that I'm translating patienting? And there's a, a final dimension that I discovered quite serendipitously as I was researching for this episode. I was led by different sources to Psalm 62, which I had not previously picked up on because um, it's not the French patiente, but it's the English to wait or finding rest. And I think this is going to help. In the ESV, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. NIV, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. And the same again in verse 5. The psalm really drives this point home. It's in other places in Scripture. But in French, it is not patienting, which is why I hadn't picked up on it initially, but it is je m'en remets. And je m'en remets is a French expression that means I place myself into you. I put myself 
on to you. It's this notion of complete leaning into a complete delegation of responsibility when it comes to the shape of the outcome. In Hebrew, it's the word dumiyu, which means passive rest, silent waiting, trust, trust, waiting and trusting. They're intricately woven together. It's saying, Lord, this is completely up to you. I'm patienting. It's up to you. I'm active in my patienting and I discover that the bulk of my energy is spent leaning into you. I commit myself into your hands or even into your hands I commit my spirit of Jesus at the cross. It's the same word, je remets. I commit myself like a patient to a hospital or back to the doctor's office, but with the added element of complete surrender, trust, commitment into the hands of the only one who can truly heal and provide. So, Patienting is, I would say, the sum of two things. Surrender plus commitment. That's active waiting. So be a patient, actively and patiently awaiting God's work in us to turn us into people who patient well to his honor and glory and our delight. Let's pray. Lord, into your hands we do commit ourselves and our waiting. Would you allow us to sow our meager seeds of patience in that through your hands, they would yield a harvest of patience that we may love others well in your name, mm, that it may be so. Amen. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too, so join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.